Hello and welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. My name is Jeannie Hoffman and I'm a psychologist here in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine and I'm the director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System here at the University of Washington. Tonight we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Alicia Furman. She is a fourth year resident here in our Department of Rehab Medicine. Her presentation is Stem Cell Therapy for Traumatic Spinal Cord Injury. She uh, will do any other introduction, but also is open to having people stop and ask, uh, stop the presentation and ask questions along the way. So feel free to do that. Dr. Furman, I turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Hoffman, for that lovely introduction. Thanks for having me here. I'm happy to be here chatting with all of y'all this evening. Uh, what I'm going to be discussing is just a few of the things involving this. This is a huge, huge topic, and there's no way we could ever hope to cover all of this in an hour and a half, but I'm going to do my best to kind of just hit the high points um, and then also allow you to kind of find some jumping off points for your own research if this is something that you want to go home and learn more about. So let's get to it. All right, so I have no disclosure, so everything you're hearing tonight is just what I have read and is my own medical opinion. It's not funded by any companies. I don't have stock in anything. Um, so there's, there's no kind of financial or other disclosures here at stake. Our goals for tonight are going to be just learning about types of stem cell therapy. So what are stem cells? What does that look like for spinal cord injury? We're going to understand what research is currently for stem cell therapy for spinal cord injury specifically and then be able to take that understanding and apply it and evaluate future research, things you might read, potential harms, benefits of participating in clinical studies um, or other types of experimental therapy. Quick outline of what we're going to be discussing tonight. We're going to start off talking about just a quick background and what types of stem cells uh, are. So my background to this topic is that I was working uh, with rehab patients and a patient's spouse approached me with this article in hand and this comes from a very well-known peer-reviewed journal called The New Yorker and it is, thanks, um, it details the story of a man named Derek who lives in Poland. Derek suffered a traumatic spinal cord injury at the T9 level, so kind of lower back level um, from a stab wound and that was roughly in 2012, I believe, and, and then after that, a few years later, had an experimental cell treatment done with something called olfactory and sheathing cells, or OECs. And it details his, his story, his recovery. Um, I think for me, as a clinician reading this, some of the things that I initially questioned or just kind of raised concerns in my mind were um, detailing how he did very intensive rehab in a couple of different settings, roughly 10 weeks or so total, which is a lot of inpatient rehab. As many of you know, our uh, length of stay in the US is usually much shorter than that on the order of a few weeks, maybe max four or five weeks. And so getting 10 weeks of therapy, that's a lot. That's fabulous. Um, and yet, even at that time, it mentions that he was not able to return to work when he got home and he was very dependent for a lot of things. And to me, I feel like if you've done 10 weeks of inpatient rehab, one of the goals, right, our goal on rehab is to make sure when you go home, you and your family are ready to do what you want to do. And you're not going to be 100% at everything, but if getting back to things like going out to, um, let's say, going out to restaurants with your family or being able to go to school, we want to get you set up with those tools, right? So for me to read that someone was still like not able to do a lot of these things was a little bit just kind of like, huh, I wonder what they worked on in rehab. And honestly, I don't know what inpatient rehab is like in Poland. It might be completely different from what we do here in the States. My only experience with inpatient rehab is here in the United States. Um, other things with this article, which uh, just kind of to touch on, he went from being what they describe as a complete injury, so T9, we're assuming in Asia A, they didn't talk about kind of um, classifications, and then after getting this experimental cell therapy done, 
they noticed a few months later he had flickers of movement in his legs and then a few months after that he noticed some sensation returned. So they mentioned he was hanging out with family and a niece or a nephew tapped him on the leg and he startled and that was the first time he realized that he had sensation. So there was definite changes there after he had this therapy done. Um, I think that it's hard to say how much of what he got back or what his recovery was is attributable just to the stem cell therapy. After he had his therapy done, this experimental cell therapy, um, he underwent more intensive rehab where he was doing it like, it, it, it describes it as eight hours a day, five days a week, which is a lot of therapy. I mean, that's a full-time job's worth of therapy. So it's also hard to say how much of his recovery, even if it's his functional recovery, um, was attributable simply to the fact that he was working really hard in an inpatient setting where every day that was his job, was just working out with the therapist, getting stronger. Um, by the end of the article, as you can see here in the picture, it details that he was able to walk with braces that essentially went from kind of his hot, uh, upper thighs down to his ankles. So what we would call either like a, an HKFO, like a hip knee ankle foot orthosis, or a kind of a high KAFO. Um, and walking in parallel bars. So he was not walking very far, but he was able to take a few steps, which was a dramatic change from where he was initially at his time of injury. All right. So why stem cells? Why is there all this talk about stem cells? Why have we always kind of heard, oh, well, that's, that's something that you know, could help for a bunch of different diseases? Well, stem cells have the ability to become almost any type of cell. That's one reason. They are readily available from a lot of places. There's a lot of different sources of stem cells. And so as um, clinicians and even as researchers, that makes them very attractive, right? It's not like they only come from one very specific thing. There's a lot of options. And then if they are what's called autologous or from self, there's a low risk of rejection. If you get a transplant with your own cells, chances are your body will tolerate it just fine. But as many of you may know, if you get a transplant or if you get someone else's cells in your body, even if it's something like blood, you can have rejection or reactions and it can be really, really, um, really, really dangerous and very serious uh, to your own life. And so that's one of the other things that we have to think about when we're talking about taking cells out of one person and putting them into another. One of the other things is that simply Stem cells are the future, right? And people all over literature and websites and blogs, this is the thing. It's like the thing to talk about. So let's go over the basics of what a stem cell is. Just start from the top. Where do they come from? There are two terms when we talk about where stem cells are coming from. There's autologous, which means from self. Uh, and then there is allogenic, which means from other people. Um, sometimes you will see uh, Xeno as a prefix there, X-E-N-O, and that usually means it's coming from another species. So in clinical trials, we're not doing that with stem cells, not for spinal cord injury at least. Um, so let's go through really quick. You are all going to be cell experts by the end of this. We start off with a lot of big words, a totipotent zygote stem cell. A zygote is a fertilized egg, so that's just one sperm, one egg, that's a zygote. Uh, and then that can become a pluripotent embryonic stem cell. Pluripotent, we'll get into that, but that can make three different layers whenever we're talking about an embryo forming. Endoderm, that makes your insides. Endo, insides, very easy, right? Intestines, lung, glands. Mesoderm, meso is middle, so it makes kind of your, your middle stuff. So it makes your blood or hematopoietic stem cells and it makes what we call stromal cells or mesenchymal stem cells. Those make things like bone, cartilage, fat, and then ectoderm, which is your outsides for the most part. So that makes your skin and your nervous system. For the purposes of this talk, we're going to be focusing really just on this part of the graph. You don't have to memorize this. There will not be a test. Um, so that's what we'll come back to later. So potency. When we say totipotent, what does that mean? So totipotent means it can become anything. The only thing that we really have that's totipotent is that zygote, which looks less like a little blue blob and more like that. Um, so that's a fertilized egg. As this totipotent zygote can become 
not only an embryo, not only a person later on, but it can also become things like the placenta. And so it's becoming things other than just that embryo. Once it differentiates past a few cells bigger than this, it becomes what's called pluripotent, which can become most things, right? So that's our, our inner, inner stuff, our middle stuff, and our outside stuff. So there was this tremendous discovery made in 2006 in Japan of something called induced pluripotent stem cells. And so this was a researcher in a lab realizing that we can take cells from our own fat tissue, for example, and induce them to become back to this stage, which is really, really cool. As far as clinical research goes, this is still super experimental. We're not putting this kind of stuff in people, especially not, um, I think, for things like spinal cord injury. And so a lot of the research is just not caught up to this. But this is, this is something that when it came out, I think this guy won the Nobel Prize. Big deal, big, big stuff. Um, other things that are pluripotent, like we talked about, embryonic stem cells. Multipotent is a little bit further down the kind of things it can become. So it can become some things. So that's things like our adult stem cells, which even though umbilical cords don't seem like adults, if it, once it's kind of past the what we call postnatal or after birth type stage, the umbilical cord is an adult stem cell source. So that's one source of adult stem cells. Um, other things would be bone marrow. So you might have heard of people getting bone marrow transplants or bone marrow pulled out to make new cells if they're getting a treatment for certain types of, of blood cancers. Um, so to kind of talk about what studies we looked at, and when we're talking about looking at the literature, we're talking about looking at medical journals um, as rigorous as we can get, right? Because if we're reading things about clinical trials, we want to make sure that it's, it's been really well researched and it's backed up and it's based on science. Types of cells include things like neurospheres. So these are a fancy term for precursor brain cells. And the study that this was taken from um, was actually used from fetal brains. So this was not a study done in the US. It was done in Korea. Um, other sources of cells in these studies were embryonic, which we talked about, cord blood and bone marrow. I just love the cord blood cross section because it kind of looks like a face. Anybody else see that? It's kind of weird. It's like, hmm. Anyway, yeah. Um, so from those adult stem cells, right, we get our mesenchymal stem cells, and we get our hematopoietic or our blood stem cells. The olfactory and sheathing cells, which is what our friend Derek had from the New Yorker, that's another thing that was in these studies. And then Schwann cells, which Schwann cells are little cells that wrap around our nerves, and they make ins insulation, essentially. It's called myelin, and so they're the myelinating cells around your nerves. This is also a really cute photo of a Schwann cell. It's not a photo, sorry. It's a drawing. It's just hugging the nerve. So let's talk about the study results. When I was looking through the medical literature, I started off doing a search of our medical literature database. 329 articles to start with that met the search terms of stem cell and spinal cord injury. Of those, 294 were excluded because not every search result is a good one, believe it or not. Uh, and then of those, 39 were kind of the final analysis. So that's the ones that I read really in depth and analyzed. And those 39 articles yielded 978 people total. So when we're talking about all of the thousands of people who have had spinal cord injuries and who are living with spinal cord injuries, the amount of people that were studied uh, with these types of stem cell therapy and kind of met the criteria and what we'll be talking about tonight is under 1,000. So just keep that in mind when we're talking about kind of uh, numbers. So where are these studies happening? Handy dandy map. If geography is not your strong suit, that's totally fine. Um, most of the studies were from uh, not the US, and part of that's just because the US has pretty stringent research guidelines on what types of stem cells can be used. And other countries are a little more relaxed. But you can see on here things like Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Thailand, Egypt, Turkey, some in South America, some in Europe, um, really all over the world. And so if you were looking into these types of clinical trials or stem cell therapies, pretty much every continent except Antarctica and I guess Australia, you could find something going on. When we're talking about variables with these studies, so no two patients are alike. And when we're discussing studies that are involving people, 
we have to talk about what was different between them. So things like timing after injury, were people acutely injured, aka were they in the first few months after injury, or had they been injured for years and years and years, right? That's going to change things. The completeness of injury, whether they're complete, so nothing below the level of their injury essentially has sensation or movement, or are they incomplete? Uh, what types of cells, again, we went through, there was a lot of different types of cells that people are trying for this. How much cells did they get? And then how were the cells given? So different routes of administration for these cells included things like doing a spinal tap, so putting them straight into the space where the spinal fluid and spinal cord are, um, actually injecting into the spinal cord itself, so using a very, very small needle in an OR setting to put cells into a spinal cord. Um, IV, uh, those are kind of the most common. And of course, with all those, you can raise your own questions, right? How do you know the cells are going to go where they're supposed to go? How do you know that they went where they, you know, where you intended? Um, how you make sure they don't go where they're not supposed to go? Lots of, lots of questions there. Who were in these studies? So what, what are we talking about? We're talking about this, this patient population, those 978 people. There was a mix of people, chronic and acute injuries, so timing was variable. They had paraplegia or tetraplegia. Some studies only included people with paraplegia, so kind of that um, if your injury is below your neck and down, or some people, uh, or some studies just included tetraplegia, which is if your injury generally is in the neck level, um, complete and incomplete. So lots of different people were included in these studies. The majority of them were chronically injured. They had paraplegia or tetraplegia, and they were complete. So going back to our cell types, right, there was a whole bunch of them. The majority of the studies used autologous, so from self, mesenchymal stem cells, so our, our middle, middle cells, uh, and that's partly because these are really easy to access. You can get mesenchymal stem cells from bone marrow. So if a patient were to participate in a study like this, it was fairly easy to say, okay, we're going to take some bone marrow out of a big bone like your, your thigh bone, and then we're going to spin it down and get the stem cells out of it. Real quick, that's where their mesenchymal stem cells are, just to kind of recap that. And so on a very broad level, there are a lot of different ways to look at does stem cell therapy help for spinal cord injury. There are a lot of things you can look at, right? You can look at did it improve pain, neuropathic pain or other types of pain? Did it improve bowel and bladder function? Did it improve strength? Did it improve sensation? I mean, there's a million things that you could look at. Um, and try to track whether someone improved or not. For the purposes of this, because spinal cord injury classification is for the most part very um, standardized, I just looked at that. So very, very objectively, or as objective as we could be, did this person's classification change on that Asia scale, which is from A to E, where an A is someone who is completely injured, so it's a complete injury, there is no sensation generally of the bowel and bladder, uh, and there's no motor function below that level of injury. And then an Asia E, which is someone who has had a spinal cord injury, but for all intents and purposes, looks, has the normal sensation and has normal strength now. So that's kind of our spectrum that we're, we're working on. And what I wanted to know is, when people got stem cell therapy, did their classification change? Did they improve? So there were 39 studies total. Of those, 26 of them documented this Asia impairment scale classification. And then of those, 18 found some benefit, so people's classifications improved, and 8 found no benefit whatsoever. So you might be saying, it helps. So what's the problem? Well, as we talked about a little bit, these studies were very different. They had different uh, different people, different injury levels, different levels of completeness, different times since injury. I mean, there was a lot of other things going on, and so it's hard to say, oh, okay, it helped. That must have been the reason. It must have been the stem cell therapy. It couldn't have been anything else. Because when you're comparing all these different studies, it's kind of apples and oranges. And you're just making, as clinicians and as researchers, we make a lot of kind of guesstimates whenever you're interpreting this data. And then although these were in what we would call peer-reviewed journals, aka these are journals that other 
scientists and researchers are reading and kind of proofreading and saying, yeah, I think your study was pretty solid. Um, they're not super what we would call strong studies. So a strong study, the best case scenario is I have what's called a randomized controlled trial, where I have two groups of people. The people are the exact same. I randomize them into groups, so I don't even know who's in what group. And then I control for everything else, which means those people are the exact same type of person, same age, same gender. They are eating the same diet. None of them smoke, or all of them smoke. And uh, all of the variables are completely controlled for. As you could imagine, that's super, super tough to do, especially with people, because we're really different, especially to begin with, right? Um, so these are more on the order of studies that we can infer some data from, but they're not what we would call the gold standard of a clinical trial. Other things to think about are, there was this lovely article done by Dr. Stephen Kirschbloom. Um, he is a very well-known spinal cord injury doc at Kessler in New Jersey. He wrote an article just following people who had chronic spinal cord injuries to see if their Asia classification changed over time. And what they found was that of people who were complete at one year, so they were what's called an Asia A, at five years, 3.5% had improved to an Asia B, and 1% had improved to an Asia C and D. So even with no treatment, no anything whatsoever, people who have chronic spinal cord injuries can change. They can still have this kind of late progression or late recovery. So that's one thing we could think about, right? If someone in a study is, has been injured for three or four years and they get a treatment done and then their classification changes, well, was it spontaneous recovery that would have happened anyway? Or was it because of the treatment that they received? In people who are acutely injured, so again, in that kind of first few months, there's another excellent article done by Dr. Kirschbloom about recovery in that acute period, right? So newly injured, and we're going to have a little table here, and I'll walk you through it. So what we're looking at is your initial grade. So that's when you first get injured. And then we have discharge from rehab and at one year. So if you're looking at just people who start off as an A, so their very first spinal cord injury exam showed that they were complete, you can see that of those, 80% remain an A when they leave rehab, which means 20% have changed. And then if you look at a year later, an, another 8% have changed and converted from a complete injury to what's called an incomplete injury. So there's a lot of change and a lot of flux and a lot of spontaneous recovery that happens in that first initial time and even a few years after a spinal cord injury. It's really important if you're doing research in people who have new injuries that you are mindful of this because you don't want to attribute a benefit or a, a beneficial effect to your treatment rather than recognizing it's something that would have happened regardless. Um, so here's a, a study example of what I would call kind of a success or an improvement uh, in, from a not Asia scale kind of recovery. So this was a Korean study. They used autologous, so self uh, mesenchymal stem cells, and they injected them into the spinal cord or the spinal space. And there was one patient who was eight months out from injury. This patient started at less than anti-gravity strength in their elbows. So that means they could not even bring their hands up to their face, or they could not extend their arms all the way out if they were lying down. Same thing with their wrist extensors. So they couldn't even bring their wrists up. And as you could imagine, if you're trying to do anything for yourself, it's really helpful if you can bring your hands to your face, because that means you can feed yourself, you can wash your face, things like that. This person had the stem cell therapy done and then returned to near full strength in those same muscles at 40 months post-treatment. So things to think about there. This person was eight months out from injury, so pretty newly injured still in the, the grand scheme of things. And then this near full strength came back at 40 months after treatment. That's a long time. That's three and a half years. So that's a lot of follow-up. Uh, another patient in this study was 38 months out from injury, so three years out. And they started at anti-gravity strength in uh, triceps. So being able to kind of hold their arm up and extend it all the way against gravity. And then got full strength back in those muscles at 39 months, so again, about three and a half years after treatment. 
That would be important if you're thinking about using your triceps for things like transferring. If you need to push up, you have to have the ability to extend and hold your body up. Another patient who was 96 months out, so eight years out from injury, had just a flicker of strength in their fingers and then regained full strength in those muscles at 30 months after treatment. So that's pretty remarkable. When you think about someone who's eight years out, they've lived with that same level of strength for eight years since their injury. They get this treatment, and then about two, two and a half, three years later, uh, they have regained strength in their fingers that they didn't have before. So when we're talking about functional outcomes and how even just gaining that one level back can make such a difference, this is a, a table of, and we're gonna, we'll break it down because I know it's a lot of text right now, a table of what a FIM score or a functional independence measure would be for certain things for a person with a complete injury at a, a specific level. So we'll walk you through it. Let's take just the bottom half of this table and we'll zoom in a little bit here. First off, we're talking about people with a level of either a C5 or a C6 level of injury. So the cervical vertebrae, fifth level, that's where the, the spinal cord would have been damaged. And the, the C5 level particularly controls things like your biceps, so bring, being able to do that elbow flexion. And C6 spef specifically controls things like your wrist extensors. So when we're talking about someone who has this level of injury, if you look just on the left side with me at the C5, small text, but I'll read it for you, talking about things like dressing, grooming, and bathing, this person we would expect to be mostly kind of in this one to three, so total assistance to moderate assistance for a lot of these activities. Um, compared with the person on the other side who's a C6, they might be a little bit more independent. So on this chart with this FIM score, higher numbers, more independence. So if you can do everything for yourself, you get sevens across the board. Um, if you need assistance with everything, you are ones across the board. Uh, so then when this functional table also estimates how much assistance you'll need total in your day, which is helpful whenever we're trying to figure out, um, you know, how much, how many hours a day is a caregiver going to need to be in your home. Someone who is a C5 level, they recommend personal care 10 hours a day, home care 6 hours a day. So we're talking 16 hours a day-ish, that's a lot of time uh, and a lot of caregiving. If that person improved just one motor level and went from a C5 to a C6, that number drops quite a bit. So personal care now is six hours a day compared to 10, and home care is now four hours a day compared to six. So when you're talking about 16 hours a day of help versus 10 hours a day of help, that's a big difference. I mean, that extra time could be something where someone could go to work, go to school, take care of kids, a lot of other things when you're not just um, depending on someone else for assistance with your daily routine. All of these studies may sound attractive, appealing. I would caution you, always beware of, uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And I think that just a really cursory Google search uh, of stem cell therapy gets you a whole bunch of websites that will gladly take your time and money if you offer it to them. Um, this is just a few of the things that came up. These are all over the world. There is this lovely kind of search database, if you will, called Placid Way. And what it does is it compiles stem cell clinics from all over. So you can just search on their search engine and find whatever you want to spend money on. So if you search spinal cord injury on that website, you get, these are kind of your numbers. You can go to Beijing, China for about 30 grand. You can go to Europe. I don't actually know where in Europe, but it's seven thousand dollars. Uh, you can do another one in Beijing that's thirty five thousand. You can go to Asia again I'm not really sure where that's a big uh, big continent uh, ninety nine hundred dollars so orders of thousands and thousands of dollars. Usually when you what do you get for that price you might be asking well if you look up at Neurogen's site over here you get a consultation you get information they even take care of your visa and your travel. It's really nice of them. Uh, they've got some payment options. They'll pick you up from the airport. They will whisk you into their operating room there once you get there. Um, they'll, usually they put you up in a really nice hotel from what I've read. You get your stem cell therapy. You do some rehab for an undetermined amount of time. And then they drop you back at the airport. 
to come back home. So if you are looking into these types of things or if you know people that have looked into these types of things, oftentimes it is not something that you can just up and go do it at the drop of a hat. It takes a lot of coordination of finances and resources and time even just to, to consider it or get a consultation. So if you see this kind of stuff, just take it with a grain of salt. Um, this is another, probably one of the slickest websites that I saw. So this is in Beijing, Bakey Stem Cells. And they um, purport to treat a lot of different ailments with stem cells, not just spinal cord injury. But on their website, they mention this really great fact that of their patients that they've treated, um, which I think have been in the hundreds of thousands or something, they've had 22,000 with no serious adverse reaction reported, which I think anytime you see no, never, always, that should be a red flag, especially when it comes to medical stuff, because if you've taken any medications or even just seen an ad for a pharmaceutical on TV, you know that there's always something, right? There's always fine print. There's always, your side effects may include nausea, heartburn, indigestion, up to the cemetery, like just everything. And so if you see some clinic claiming that there have been no serious adverse reactions reported, should raise some, raise some red flags. This clinic is not in the States, but if they were, what is an adverse reaction, right? What does that mean? Does that mean you were in the hospital? Does that mean you got sick? You got a fever? Uh, according to the FDA, a serious adverse reaction is death obviously, uh, a life-threatening adverse reaction, inpatient hospitalization, or prolongation of a current hospitalization, or a persistent or significant incapacity or disruption of the ability to conduct your normal life functions. So really even just kind of getting a serious illness should be considered a serious adverse reaction. Things to think about. All right, next up, we're gonna do a quick video. So just briefly, this is Dr. Gita Schroff. She is a retired obstetrician. So she was originally a doctor who delivered babies, and she became a self-taught embryonic stem cell researcher. She has a clinic. She has this really great investigation that um, was done a few years ago by CNN, where she says that she treats everything from spinal cord injury to autism to cerebral palsy, a litany of other birth defects. So I just want you to watch this video and kind of think about what your impressions of her are. Um, is this something you would go do? Do you feel like she's selling the magic pill? Do you feel like this can't be uh, real? We'll get your opinions on it. How old is this video? Uh, I think it's a few years old. It's, it's Anderson Cooper 360, so it can't be that old, I guess. But um, I think it's 2014 or 2015. According to Schroff, and a sliding scale of success she drew up based on the treatments she offers, her results are phenomenal. As of right now, I would say almost everyone, let's say greater than 90% patients, have had success. Our tests and we asked CNN's Dr. Sanjay Gupta about Dr. Schroff's claims for success. And we just don't see any data coming from any of these other labs. If it works, if you've proven that it's safe, it's, it's a pretty simple thing to publish and, and, and have it looked at by, by your own peers. This woman is either a miracle person in terms of embryonic stem cell research or a fraud. It, it's, it's concerning no matter how you look at it. You can inject cells that are not, are not pure in some way and you could potentially cause harm. If it's working and she's doing it the right way, she should write it up. I mean, that's what scientists do. It's what we've been trained to do. Yes, if you, we'll pause there. Any just initial thoughts? Oh, 2012. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, thoughts, comments, suggestions just on watching that right now. Anyone? 90% success rate. That right there is a 90% success rate. Yeah. I mean, I think particularly when you're looking at someone who is treating a wide range of ailments with kind of the exact same treatment, right? So she's putting the same stem cells in every body. Um, for all kinds of different things. And 90% of people, regardless of what they're getting treated for, get better. Any other? Uh... She did develop her own measure. I think that's particularly important um, for us. It's, and I've, I've seen a lot of this even just in, from other in peer-reviewed journals where 
researchers did a study and they said, we wanted to measure outcomes, so we invented our own scale. And so here's our outcomes. And it's, it's difficult, right? Because if I say, all right, on the Fermin scale of 1 to 10, everybody's a 10, you don't know. Um, and it's hard to say. Has anyone else used that scale? Yeah. All right. Other things we got to talk about include risks. So this is a case report. So this was one specific person, an 18-year-old woman at the time of her injury. She had the olfactory or that nasal stem cell transplant done three years after her injury. And this was following a very rigorous protocol. So she went to a well-known hospital. These researchers had done this surgery before, um, had these nasal stem cells put into her spinal cord, and then eight years later had back pain. So came to her doctor and said, I'm having a lot of back pain, and they got another MRI. So what, what is that thing? What is this? So you can see it's not here, right? This is where her level of injury was. Yeah, it kind of looks like a tumor. It definitely doesn't look like normal spinal cord. Um, intraoperatively, so this is what they found. So this is to orient you. Sorry if any of you are a little bit blood shy. I should have warned. Um, what they are doing is they are suctioning out this kind of thick, white, mucousy material from her spinal cord. And what they found was that this Goomba right here was those nasal stem cells were still making mucus. They were still doing their nasal job. And so she just had a lot of a mucousy-like material in her spinal cord. And they, they removed that, and her back pain got better. Um, why aren't there more stem cell trials if, we're, if there are so many opportunities, right? Um, so Consumer Reports, this was just published January 11th of 2018. Um, did this excellent article. I would encourage you, even if you're just looking at medical treatments or buying a new air conditioner, check out Consumer Reports. They're really good. They put stuff really straightforward language. I like, I like reading their stuff. And they, they talk about in this article, they discuss two people who had stem cell treatments done for COPD, for um, obstructive lung disease, right? And they spent seven or $8,000 a piece and neither one of them got any better. And it turns out that this clinic is now being sued and there's a lot of, of legal stuff going on. And when you're talking about stem cell trials, there's just so many things to kind of take into consideration. So there's a lack of standardization. We'd already talked about it's hard to find two identical people, much less a whole group of people that are similar. We don't have a really great standardized, OK, this is the type of stem cell. This is how you give it. This is how much to give, right? Because we're talking on the order of millions of cells where we're putting them into people's bodies. We should know what the dose needs to be. And then how do we give them? Do we put it into your spinal cord? Do we put it into the spinal cord space and just hope it gets there? Do we put it in an IV? Um, again, it's really difficult to randomize or control for these things because people are really different. The other thing is there's just not a lot of people with spinal cord injury who want to participate in these types of studies or who are willing to tolerate the risks necessarily, um, or even just to get close to a clinical research center, right? If you live in most parts of the country, you're not near a big scientific center. And so that can be time off work, travel, money, costs, uh, from all other types of things. So it's just not feasible to get large patient populations to do these types of studies. For the, in the states, at least, FDA approval is usually lacking or really slow. Again, um, stem cell research is a little bit behind in the United States in some people's opinions compared to the rest of the world, and that's just because our FDA uh, has its own sets of rules and regulations for that. And then expensive. I mean, it costs money to do these types of procedures. It costs money to have the types of technology to even harvest and spin down stem cells, uh, much less than to have an operating room that you can put cells back into someone. Uh, for people who are participating in these studies, it's travel, it's sick time, it's somebody's got to watch your kids. There's a lot of other costs that go into these types of things. And then as we talked about, there's this unclear level of risk. It's just, it's difficult to say what all the risks are that are involved. So that gets a little bit into the ethics of these types of treatments. So what, what does ethics actually got to do with it, right? We can say, Let's talk about it, but what are we really discussing? Um, one paper 
describes that the first consent should be obtained before the operation, shortly after the injury occurs, so this case is a spinal cord injury, uh, but in this case the patient was sedated and his family was upset. So it was hard to get an informed consent form signed, right? It's hard whenever someone has just had a very life-changing injury to come up to them and say, hi, I know that your loved one has a tube down their throat or they are in the intensive care unit, um, but could, could I talk to you about this experimental study? And that gets into a little bit about what we would call medical vulnerability. So when you are in the hospital, and oftentimes people who have any kind of chronic illness uh, meet the definition of medical vulnerability, which simply means a social group who has increased relative risk or susceptibility to an adverse health outcome. And I think particularly for people with spinal cord injury, most people with spinal cord injury do have an increased risk of a lot of adverse health outcomes. So from a, a medical perspective, this is a vulnerable population. I think that also doesn't even get into the fact that um, when you've had a life-changing injury, oftentimes it's hard to see beyond those first few days. And so from a healthcare provider perspective, my goal is always to show you that there's life after these types of, you know, very different changes in function. There's life after a spinal cord injury. You can still do a lot of things you'd like to do. You can still go coach your kid's soccer team or go kayaking or do a lot of these other things. Um, and so for us as healthcare providers, we have to think about that in terms of vulnerability as well, as we have a duty to tell people what they don't yet know about their injuries. So when we talk about reporting, we also have to talk about balance, right? Um, this is my friend Alex. She's an excellent yogi. I can't do that. That's not me. Um, so when we're talking about reading news about stem cell therapy, we have to figure out too, is it balanced? Is there bias? It, was someone putting some spin on this? So on spinal cord injury advocacy websites, so that's things like the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, that's things like um, Miami uh, Project. Um, when they mention stem cells, the ratio of positive to negative statements. Anybody want to take a stab? Take a guess. What do you think the ratio was of positive to negative statements on spinal cord injury websites? One to nine. OK. So this is positive to negative. What do we think? Where do we think the balance is? I want to, I want to get some odds here. Anybody? 80-20, OK, all right, all right. 40-60, OK, good. I like that people are kind of, maybe it was more positive, maybe it was more negative. Um, so positive and negative statements were actually 10 to 1. So even on, on advocacy websites, which are oftentimes where we direct people after they have a spinal cord injury to get information, overwhelmingly, it just kind of skews positive. And then of that content, uh, that content pertaining to ethics was about 20%. So again, thinking about what are you reading, and are you reading kind of the full story, or are you getting a little bit of a skew or a spin, good to, good to think about. Um, when you're looking at things like social media, if you're looking at tweets, and it might be that when you're on Twitter, you're only following uh, the people that you know and love, or it could be that you're seeing everything and then some. So if you're looking at spinal cord injury tweets, and again, this study was from 2015, so it's three years old now. Um, they found that overwhelmingly they were neutral or positive. So most people that are tweeting about stem cell therapy have either a neutral stance or they're saying something positive. And that could be because a lot of people, if you've undergone this very expensive treatment, maybe your friends and family helped you pay for it and it didn't do what you wanted it to, or maybe you didn't get overwhelming success, maybe you're not going to tweet about it or you're not going to post on Facebook about it because you're going to say, oh, I don't want to... I don't want to tell everybody that all that money that we just spent really didn't change or didn't give me the outcome that I wanted. So that could be one reason why a lot of what we see out on the internet is more overwhelmingly positive or, or uh, definitely not negative. So again, we're thinking about balance here, right? Another excellent study was done by a neurosurgeon where they asked people who had been chronically injured, what would you want your chances to be of getting some functional recovery back? So if you did a stem cell, treatment of some kind, what do you want the odds to be? Do you want like a 10% chance of success? Do you want a 100% chance of success? Um, so to break down this bar graph here, on our y-axis, this is our percent, uh, percentage of responders. And on our x-axis here is the odds of recovery, right? 
So you can see kind of the highest column wanted at least a 5 to 25% chance, which might seem kind of low to some people. Um, but that was you know, a third of the group. And really, if you're just looking at kind of this half, you can see that about half of the respondents really just wanted somewhere from like 1 to 25 or 1 to 50. Very few people wanted this better than a coin flip chance of functional recovery. So there's a lot of willingness to tolerate low chance of recovery. Um, I think that that's also something to keep in mind, is, is people may be more willing to take risks than we think. This same study also asked about very specific risks. And so what they asked about were, what, what would you be willing to tolerate if you did these types of experimental therapies, including things like a spinal fluid leakage, which can result in a longer hospital stay. You might need surgery, gives you a bad headache. Infection, including meningitis, or infection of your brain membranes. Uh, nerve pain, spinal cord damage causing worse function, or cancer. So what, what are you willing to tolerate risk-wise? And I think when you're looking at these, uh, it ranges from a 0.1% chance of this happening to a 10% chance of this happening. The most important thing or most telling thing to me here is this pink box, which is difficult to kind of outline here. But the pink box is, I would have participated regardless of the risk. It could have, the risk could have been, for any one of these things, I would have participated anyway. And you can see that's a pretty sizable chunk of a lot of these. Um, I think when you're thinking about tolerating risk, it's always more telling to know if you've already experienced that before. So most people with a spinal cord injury have probably experienced nerve pain. So they're willing to tolerate that risk because that might be something they already have. Less likely have people have probably had cancer, but a lot, you know, 17% of the respondents were still willing to tolerate that risk if it meant that they could have a chance at improved function. So again, we need to be talking with uh, people who are participating in these kinds of studies and really saying, what, what's your risk tolerance? Some people are really risk averse, that's fine. Some people would say, hey, go for it. Um, our literature, kind of to encapsulate all of that, literature supports that the majority of stem cell therapy information that's out there is neutral or positive on websites and on social media. Uh, in that one study, the majority of respondents would, would be satisfied with anywhere from a 1 to 50% chance of functional recovery after some kind of stem cell therapy. And then up to 25% of the respondents in that study were willing to participate in stem cell therapy regardless of the risk. So when you're looking at future studies, what kind of question should you ask? This comes from the New England Journal of Medicine, and I've kind of paraphrased some of the questions specifically for this talk, including things like, were the assessments performed in a blinded manner? This is really important because even if uh, I'm trying not to think about it or, or anything like that. If I know that you've had a certain treatment and then I'm assessing you later, even subconsciously I might say, oh, you seem like you're stronger. You seem like you're better. Or even in kind of the worst case scenario, if I have some kind of financial incentive for you to get better and I know you took my drug, I'm absolutely going to say that you got better, right? Because I want my drug to do well and I want people to buy it and spend lots of money. So blinding or not allowing the person who is evaluating you to know whether you got the treatment or not is really helpful. The other method of blinding is actually not allowing the person or patient to know if they got the treatment or not. That's a little more difficult with things like stem cell therapy. Um, but in other types of studies where they've done things like therapeutic spinal taps, the way that they've done that is they've anesthetized someone, and they put a little poke in their back, and they cover it with a Band-Aid. And then you don't actually know if someone you know, put medicine in your spinal canal or not. So were things blinded? Were participants followed? And for this, it's at least four months over treatment. I think four months is really short in the grand scheme of spinal cord recovery. I would much prefer things like some of those studies where we're talking where people followed up for years and years. Again, from a researcher perspective, that's expensive. It's expensive to keep bringing people back to clinic. Um, it's expensive for people to travel to come back to clinic. And then are the results reproducible? And that's something you should be asking yourself anytime you see really great findings, even again if it's reading you know, about a juice cleanse, like, well, did everybody who did that get the same results? Or did only one person? Um, 
other essential questions to ask a stem cell clinic, and this comes from the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Um, so you can either look it up on their website or it'll be, I think, in my references at the end of this uh, as well. We'll go through these kind of one by one. First off, is the treatment FDA approved? And if not, why not? Just really quick and easy, is this something that has been researched and vetted by a government body? And if not, why? Will this affect whether I can get into another clinical trial? I think that's really important because even if you're doing another clinical trial for you know, a, an experimental heart failure drug down the road or an experimental cancer drug down the road, if you were in a trial where you ex received an experimental therapy, that could invalidate you to participate in future studies of anything, not just for your spinal cord injury. And so it's very important to think about that in the long term. What benefits can I expect? Anyone worth their salt should be able to tell you at least a little bit. If they've done this before and other people, they should know what benefits uh, people have experienced and what to expect. And then how will this be measured and how long will it take? Again, this all goes back to what are they saying the benefit's going to be? Is the benefit going to be better pain control? Is it going to be strength? Is it going to be sensation? How are they checking that? Did they invent their own scale to measure that? All, all really important things. More questions would be, what other medications might I need? So what other things are you going to have to be on? Is that medication going to interact with medications you already take? Um, how is the stem cell procedure done? Getting a really good, again, anyone who's doing this in a legitimate manner should be able to tell you very exactly what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Where the stem cells are coming from, very, very important. Because again, if it's not coming from you, what if your body rejects it? How are they going to protect against that? How are the stem cells identified? So where do they get them from? How do they know that they're stem cells? Is this just they, they cross their fingers and they hope? Are they looking under a microscope? Is there some kind of more um, specific assay going on that they're examining these cells with? And how are they growing them? Are they differentiated? Again, how do they know if they're going to the right part of the body or not? And then if they're not my own, how do I know that they're not going to cause a really adverse reaction in me? So figuring out, do you have to be on immunosuppressive drugs? Is this like that kind of a transplant? Is there going to be some other medication that they expect you to take with these? And then lastly, what do the cells actually do? And what scientific evidence is there that this procedure is actually going to work? And I would say specifically for spinal cord injury. Have they done this for spinal cord injury? Do they have evidence? Can they show you? something that was published in a journal somewhere where they've done it before, and it's been reproducible, and that's what they're basing it on. So on the horizon, there are a lot of places around the world that are doing these types of things. This is just a few that I found when I was uh, reading up for this, including things like autologous or allogenic cells all over the world, again, different types. We don't have to read them all here. And then if you're not really into thinking about stem cell therapy, there are other options as well. So non-stem cell therapy things would be things like uh, medications. Some are a little more experimental. So Cethrin was the drug that was originally developed. And then I think in the 2008 recession, the company that owned it sold it off or went bankrupt or something. And so it just kind of languished. And then someone else bought it and picked it up and started trying to use it for other things. Uh, things like fibroblast growth factor, minocycline, which is a very common antibiotic, rilazole, which is currently used for things um, like ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, but then is also being experimentally used now for spinal cord injury. Things like liver cell growth factors, this is a diabetes drug, glyburide, delfampyrimidine is something we use often in people with multiple sclerosis. And then even things that are like not really medications, like hypothermia or just making your body really cold, Hyperbaric oxygen, so just being in like a dive chamber type thing, um, acute intermittent hypoxemia, or just changes in blood pressure. So there's a lot of things if stem cell therapy is not your cup of tea or if you're interested in non-stem cell related treatment options or experimental therapies, there's still a lot of other, other things out there. So I'm interested in learning more. What do I do next, right? Hopefully by this point you've realized I'm going to say do your homework. Like that's the first and foremost thing. One great resource is Closer Look at Stem Cells.org. It's the International Society for Stem Cell Research. They have a really excellent patient handbook that's on there that explains in very plain language, non scientific jargon, what stem cells are, and just looking at really basic types of research and how to interpret those. 
So that's one thing, closer look at stemcells.org. How do I learn more about clinical trials? In the US, you can look at the NIH website. They have a database of all the clinical trials that are currently going on. You can search in their little search box and find there were a ton of results when we searched the other day. Everything from medications to non-medication type of treatments. So lots of, lots of trials out there. Take home points for tonight would be stem cell therapy for spinal cord injury has shown some benefit, but it's not without risks of its own. So I think making sure you know that benefits are not guaranteed and that there are risks. If you're considering stem cell therapy, please do your homework. Be aware of anecdotal evidence or testimonials. So if the only proof that a clinic can show you is four pictures of people who are happy, satisfied customers and a couple of sound bites or blurbs about them, that's really not scientifically based. That's what we call anecdotal evidence. And that could be biased. That could just be patently untrue. So beware of that. And then I think on that same note, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, I want to thank these people, Dr. Jones, Dr. John, Dr. Bunnell. They helped me with this presentation. The library, because they are excellent with helping with this kind of stuff. So I will take questions now at this time. So the question was, is there some kind of repository where everyone who's learning about these types of things or everyone who's researching these things are all kind of sharing their ideas, right? They're not keeping them secret just so they can get a, a patent or a trade or something like, uh, like that. I think the biggest repository would just be the scientific literature. So looking in things like medical journals, um, because as uh, Sanjay Gupta said, anyone who has done something good in the medical community or discovered something new is going to want to publish it because you share knowledge that way. And I think, uh, again, any, any doctor or scientist or researcher who is ethical is going to want to share information. They're not going to want to keep it secret because it's not so much about trying to make a quick buck. It's about furthering uh, furthering the medical community as a whole, right? And doing what's best for, for people. Um, so I think that's the biggest repository. I think otherwise things like the uh, ISCCR, the International Society, and things like that often will have conventions, but that's usually more scientifically based where people, again, share ideas. Yeah, Dr. Jones in the back. Yeah. Right, yeah, so absolutely. So Dr. Jones just pointed out the caveat to medical literature is that there's a lag. Anytime you do good research, even if it's phenomenal research, you still have to write it up. You still have to submit it. It still has to get published. That can take months to years. Um, and so, for instance, she mentioned how in Louisville there's epidural spinal cord stimulation uh, trials undergoing and what they've published so far is lagging quite a bit behind what they're doing currently clinically. And even if their results have been reproducible, it's just what you see in the literature may not be um, totally up to speed. So definitely a good thing to think about. Thanks. Yeah, so the question's about animal research and what the results show there. There is a ton of animal research out there. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I specifically just looked at human results, because the animal results are in, I mean, just the thousands and tens of thousands. Um, as far as is there a consensus, no, not quite. A lot of what we're doing in human trials has been shown to be reproducible in animal trials. So that's usually the progression of things as they start off kind of doing things with cells in a dish and then move up to animal models. And then from animal models, if it shows to be fairly safe, reproducible, everything seems to be going according to plan, they'll move up to human trials. Um, but as far as animal models go, so the olfactory and sheathing cells, I think, were first developed in, in animal models, in rats specifically, and then progressed to humans. Other things would be like Schwann cells, or the cells that make the insulation around nerves. That's been shown to help. And one of the animal studies is actually cited in that New Yorker article as well, where it talks about the guy, before he started doing trials in humans, was just doing trials in mice, where he gave them a spinal cord injury and then put certain cells in their spine and just waited to see how long. Um, things improved. So not a total consensus, but I think a lot of animal researchers are really looking closely at that because they know if they can get something that seems pretty foolproof, that getting it into humans is going to be a lot easier because asking for um, kind of clearance from any government body, if you can prove that it's done well in animal studies, you're much more likely to get cleared to do it in people. Yeah. Yep, yep. So it's National Institutes of Health. You can also just Google National Institutes of Health clinical trials or I think US clinical trials. 
Generally, if it's a website that ends in .gov, it's something that it, you can trust should be pretty reputable um, compared with things that might end in like .gov or dot, um, excuse me, .com or .org because, as you may know, anybody who wants to buy a domain name can and they can set up their own blog and publish wherever they want. So it's, again, check your sources. If you have questions, uh, talk to either someone that you trust, like your healthcare provider, or uh, talk to friends and family. Sometimes you can just look at a website and kind of say, ah, oh, this just looks a little too, too perfect or a little too sketchy, and, and you can vet it that way. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say it's, it's not necessarily that people are disconnected from reality. I think oftentimes the type of news that spreads is the good news, right? Um, and so you want to hear about the good things. And then similarly, people want to share the good things. And so if you know anyone that's tried anything experimental or new or kind of on the cutting edge, they're probably a lot more likely to tell you about it if they had a good outcome or if they did well on it compared with not. But I agree. I mean, it's definitely it's a, it's a, a glaring discrepancy to say that when we look at uh, websites and the internet and social media, how overwhelmingly positive it is when there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of scientific data. Yeah, so the, the comment is, you know, a lot of people who may have spinal cord injuries in this room might have had an article shoved in their face whenever they first got injured about stem cells or some kind of new cutting edge therapy and how, uh, you know, now the, the running joke is five more years. And I, I would agree, even from a, a medical professional perspective, and I see Dr. Hoffman nodding too, a lot of us had heard, you know, even from when I was in medical school to now, you know, just five or ten more years and we'll be there, we're going to have it. And I think that just shows how complex these types of injuries are um, and how as much as we'd like to be just on, on the fast train to scientific discovery, it takes time and it takes a lot of effort uh, and it takes a lot of manpower. Yeah. What kind of negative information did I gather in my research? Yeah. What were some of the negative viewpoints that you saw? Yeah. Um, so besides things like that one woman who had essentially kind of a, a snot ball in her spinal cord, um, I think a lot of it were things like just adverse reactions to the treatment. And so some of that was people who got that treatment and as a result of having an operation or procedure got sick, so they got infections. They got fevers. Um, anytime you're messing around in the spinal cord, if you get an infection, that can be life-threatening really, really quickly. And so oftentimes that was kind of the, the main thing. And then some people had worsening pain. So that was one very common adverse reaction, either kind of initially right after. And sometimes I think that's because if you're injecting something into the spinal cord, which kind of still gives me the heebie-jeebies to say it, um, that you could be damaging more nerves, right? Um, a lot of what I saw did not involve the people got worse per se. It was more just that they didn't get better or that they had these other kind of non-spinal cord injury related things like worse pain, infection, fever, staying in the hospital a long time, things like that. Yeah. Questions otherwise? Comments? So he started off complete. So I think they categorized him as a T9 complete. And then um, because after he had had that treatment or after X number of time, uh, he improved, he changed to an incomplete. So I think it mentioned that now he had some sensation of bowel and bladder on top of having those flickers of movement in his legs and some sensation in his legs. So his initial injury was in July, I want to say of 2010. He had the treatment surgery in 2012, and then a few months later got flickers back in his leg. So he was a couple of years out from injury um, after doing that therapy for months and months. And then at the time of that article, he was walking with a walker and, a, and the KAFOs, the really high braces. So he was walking in either parallel bars like this or with a walker, kind of, it sounds like a few feet at a time. It was definitely not, he can just pick up and walk across the grocery store type of walking. And it was very slow, and it mentions that too. I think the journalist who did this article does describe his function pretty accurately in saying that it's hard for him. Sometimes 
Some days he's more tired than others, so he really just can't do much walking at all. And some days he can walk, you know, in the gym with assistance for much more than just the length of the parallel bar. So it's variable. Um, I think that anytime, if you're talking about functional walking, you've got to talk about, okay, you're walking, but how many steps? And is it your fastest way of getting around? Is it your safest way of getting around? Um, you know, if you're able to take a few steps, but you risk falling and hurting yourself more every time you do that, that's really not functional. So it's important to keep those kinds of outcomes in mind, too, when we're talking about what someone can do. Any other questions? Okay, great. Right. Well, thanks. Join me and, uh, thank you, Dr. Yeah, thanks for your time.